blind, they can't seem to tell me what I need to get right. Your eyes, they can't seem to understand what I realize. Realize, this isn't just a dream, stuck on a bad repeat, fighting the air to breathe. You can't touch me now. Doesn't have to be you winning over me. You can't touch me now. They see lies all the time and keep me static in a rewind. Confine. This isn't just a dream, stuck on a bed and feet, fighting the air to breathe. You can't touch me now. It took me a while to see it doesn't have to be you winning over me. You can't touch me now. It's all I got is so bad, man You know, the feeling of fall every year, it's summertime, and then you start getting those crisp mornings. The air is different. The sky looks different. Uh, the colors the, the colors of the environment look different. There's something has changed, and summer is starting to go away, and fall has begun. And I can remember as a kid, because, you know, I was always having to play outside, and I remember turning that page from summer to fall as a kid, and it was even before I hunted. But I had some kind of weird feeling it would always take over in the fall inside me that said I needed to be outside. Um, I need to be outside participating in nature somehow. And I always had a yearning to hunt. You know, growing up as a kid, I, I watched, I, I listened to my dad's stories and my uncle's stories, elk hunting back in the good old days. And I watched some elk hunting film one time and these guys were, we're, uh, we're hunting elk, I'm not even sure where. And I, I'm not even sure who it was. It, maybe it was an old, uh, maybe it was an old Eastman's uh, film back from the, the early, you know, from the 70s or something. But uh, I, I watched that and I told my mom, I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be an elk hunter when I grow up um, for a living. And she, she laughed a lot about that, which, you know, a kid, kid wants to be a fireman, kid wants to be a policeman. Well, I wanted to be an elk hunter um for some weird reason and 
I never really thought that I would ever be able to do this for a living. And now, you know, working for Phelps calls, then, then I'm able to do that. But anyway, back then I had that, that weird, strange feeling that I think we all kind of get when, when the fall air starts striking us, you know, it starts getting crisp in the mornings. You start feeling like fall. It's like, it's time, it's time to go hunting and, and you can feel it. And I, and I think that that must be some kind of a, a throwback to primal man. Um, and, and knowing winter's coming and you need to, you need to double your efforts on, uh, on, on gathering your food and, and, and hunting. And, and I think, I think I, I, I'm the, that urge is very strong with me and I don't think I could stay home a single day in September, uh, regardless if I, if I have a tag or not, even, even with my wounded wing, I, I, I could not stay home and just sit on the sidelines. As a kid, I was always pretty intrigued by, uh, calling animals. I thought, I thought it was cool if I could somehow call an animal to me, I, I had fooled them. And I did this all the time. You know, I grew up in a time and in a household where, um, video games they just weren't allowed at my house you know we didn't have them. my dad my dad was a firm believer if you wanted to do something and entertain yourself get outside and go do it so we had this big field in behind our house it didn't belong to us but these far these uh, ranchers would put out uh, their cows during the summertime so I would I would get a my recurve bow and I would go out there and I would shoot try to shoot birds with a buddy and of course it never even come close because it was just a crappy little recurve and we'd lay on our backs and shoot arrows into the sky and 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 then run and hope they didn't hit ourselves. I mean, we were we we're idiots, but that's what kids do back then. Or that's what kids did back then. So these cows were always out there and I always kind of watched them and watched what they do. And they used to make a lot of different, different communications and noises to each other. And, and they'd start mooing all the time. And I noticed like if one would kind of start mooing like in like a... a in a distress type situation, the other would, others would come over and kind of check it out. So I thought it'd be grand if I could call these stupid cows in. So there was a big ditch out there and I'd go lay in the ditch and I'd start calling to them. Marr, marr. And I'd slowly just start doing that. And then as I go, I'd start escalating the, the, the noises. Marr, marr. And it would become borderline ridiculous, the noises I would make. But the funny thing is, those cows, they would start taking notice and they're like, something's going on over there. <laughs> Jerry's getting murdered or something. So the whole field of cows, there'd be like 50 cows, they'd start moving over to my direction. And there's always this one that would always be in the front. And they would come up and they would, they would walk right up to that ditch and look at me like, what's going on here? <laughs> I'd jump out and scare the crap out of them, and it was hilarious, man. I had the best fun doing that. And I think uh, somehow in my head, I thought, you know, elk hunting, calling elk would be similar to that, you know. It seemed like the more emotion I put into my, my calls that I, that I made to the cows, um, the beef cows, then it would, it would call in an elk. So the more emotion I would put into my elk calls would surely make the elk come in. And man, it does. It works like a charm. I started out hunting when I was 12 and my dad, he didn't really like to hike around. He said, hey, we don't want to go beat the brush for other people. Well, beat the brush was walk around and spook out game to someone else and let them shoot it. So he thought it'd be better if we just kind of drove around and looked for deer. We never got any deer that way because of course they were quick. And I don't think he really even really wanted to get a deer. I think he just liked driving around and look at the mountains and stuff. But I wanted more out of hunting. Um, so when I was 13, um, I said, Hey, I'm just gonna go, I'm gonna go walk around the woods. Even if I have to go by myself, I'm gonna go look for deer and try to get a deer by hunting the normal way. And my dad's like, well, okay, that's fine. So he would drop me off. But most of the time my mom would drop me off. She'd get up early. She'd make me breakfast. She would come and get me out of bed and she would drive me. And, and sometimes she'd actually even follow along and go with me. Um, we would go sit in the, the cold, in the snow and the cold for hours, waiting for a big buck to walk out. And she would sit right there with me. Um, and I think she just, she really enjoyed all that time spent together. So, and to think about today's day and age, you know, even my son at 13, I don't think I, I don't know that I could have took him out and dropped him off and let him hunt by himself 
and and felt good that he was going to be able to come back so it definitely was a different time um but i was driven you know i even before i was ever 13 i would i spent a lot of time in the woods you know i'd go i would have to walk from my house and walk about two miles to till i got to to the to the woods i'd walk around looking at everything looking at rubs looking at scrapes looking at the what the woods had to offer so i was i kind of knew my way around the woods a little bit so i think my parents felt okay with with that so my mom would drop me off and she'd be like all right it'd be three o'clock or 3 30 i'd get out of school she dropped me off at 3 30 and uh i'll pick you up after dark so i would just meet her back where she dropped me off and i'd go hunt till till dark and i did that for several years and that's that's how i cut my teeth hunting so i started bow hunting when i was 15 years old and um, i was blessed with growing up in elk country uh, i could literally step out my door and in 10 minutes drive 10 minutes and be chasing bugling bulls um, as a 15 year old boy i had i hadn't even gotten my driver's license yet um, so that's where my mom came into play uh, she would she would get me up early she'd make me breakfast every single day of september um, i would go elk hunting before school and on the weekends i would go after school um, and she was there she she would um, she'd get me up put me in the pickup and drive me out drop me off sometimes she'd wait sometimes she'd just leave me for if it was the weekend she'd leave me all day uh, and then come pick me up later or i'd walk all the way home so it was it was pretty awesome my mom was awesome my dad would do the same thing sometimes um but he was kind of over elk hunting you know he'd elk hunted the heydays of idaho uh back in the 40s when there were the epic herds that rivaled any any herd in the nation you know they had a huge elk herd here um in the clearwater region of north idaho and he was kind of over elk hunting because it was nothing like what he'd experienced as a young man uh, but he was very supportive of it. But he, he didn't think I could kill an elk with a bow. He's like, you can't kill an elk with a bow. So I was very determined. I saved my own money. Um, I worked hard all summer putting up hay for farmers. And I bought my first bow set up and camouflage and calls. And I was determined to kill an elk with my bow. So the third day of season, I'd been hunting with my best friend uh, the first two days. He got in trouble with his old man for lipping off about something so he was grounded for the day my best friend randy and we uh so i was i was going solo that day other than my mom my mom had to uh take me out and she said well i'm gonna wait today it was a saturday and she waited in the pickup and uh we we'd spotted some elk um on the way to the spot so she pulled we pulled over about a half mile from where we saw the elk and i got out and walked down this old logging road and uh, there was an active uh, logging job going on at the, at the time but it was the weekend so equipment wasn't running but there was an old road grader parked in the road so I got past the road grader just I don't know probably 50 60 yards I started bugling this bull and immediately he started answering and I didn't really know anything about calling elk other than what I'd kind of seen Larry D. Jones and some of the other guys at the time making DVDs, seeing what they had done. So I figured if I can if I can just role play with an elk and try to be an elk and start a fight and make him mad enough to come fight and then let him know I had some cows, then there was a reason to fight. And and it worked like a charm. He came right in. He came right into that old logging road. And it was actually a well well traveled road to, that they'd been hauling logs on. And he walked right out onto that road about 15 yards from me and I shot him with my bow um, and he ran probably four or five hundred yards and, and died and couldn't believe it. Uh, my first bull elk, first year bow hunting and um, I ran back to the truck, told my mom, she's like, I heard the whole thing. She was so excited. She went home, told, told my dad and my dad had told me, he's like, if you kill an elk with your bow, I'll I'll pay you back for what you'd you'd spend on your gear. So she said, get the <laughs> get the come along the pickup and your 450 bucks because Dirk got an elk. So I don't think I've ever seen my dad prouder. And from that day on, I was I was hooked. Um, I spent every day of September growing up. I didn't play sports. Um, my folks didn't believe in in sports. They said I should be at home doing 
family stuff. So I wanted to be hunting. So that's they supported that. So I went hunting every single day, whether I was with a friend or I'd leave my if if I was tagged out, I'd leave my stuff at home and I'd go out in the woods because I wanted to see what the animals were doing and learn as much as I possibly could about them. So my dad was a, a big part of um, who I am today, you know. Um, he was a very stern man. Uh, he was the epitome of old school. Um, you know, he'd, he'd survived the Great Depression. Him and his family uh, lived on very tight means, near, probably nearly starved to death, you know, during the Great Depression. Um, he fought in World War II in the Pacific Theater. He'd fought on Iwo Jima and all those those South Pacific islands uh, and seen all the horrors that that war has to offer. Um, you know, he, he came to Idaho, you know, to, to get away and find some solace uh, in life, if you will, um, to try to get away from all those hauntings of, of the war. And he moved to this little town of Weipe. And it was perfect because like he would tell it, he's like, there were more bears than there were people. He said, you, he said, it was nothing to see bears run across the road all the time. He's like, back then you didn't have to have a tag to shoot bears. So they shot bears and they ate them and they would render the, render the fat down into grease. And that's, you know, they lived in an old school manner. You know, they made their own food. They cured their own hams. So hunting the back country of Idaho at its peak was, was phenomenal. And I listened to those stories, you know, and it just, it just made me have, a yearning to to chase elk and and bugling bulls and to and to and to, to see all these wild places, um, and my dad, you know, he was he was a hard, he was a hard man, you know, and he never he never just let us get away with with saying no, I don't want to do it or uh, I I can't do it. He was just like no, you're doing it, and there was, there was no argument. Um, you just did it, and. Um, he always said, you know, if a job is worth doing, it's worth doing right. And that's, that's really, you know, really shaped me as a man. You know, I've always, I've always had that same, uh, same mantra and work ethic. If it's worth doing, do it, do it right the first time. And I don't, I don't want to have to do it twice. Probably my favorite all time favorite, uh, elk hunting story, um, experience I've ever had was the fall of 2007. Um, I'd hunted quite a bit. That year, I'd, I'd had a week off and I'd, I'd had some time to hunt and came home empty-handed. And I had I had a couple more days of uh, season left to where I could go hunting. And I'd gone home and and my son Austin was nine years old, just on the cusp of becoming ten. And it was September 23rd. And we went out elk hunting. And 2007 was a great year, man. North Idaho had tons of elk then. The wolves hadn't really decimated everything yet. And we'd uh, we drove around, we'd hiked down into some hell holes, we'd called in some bulls, couldn't get shots. And the day was starting to fade away. And you know, we were in the last couple hours of the day and we took our dirt bikes and Austin wanted to ride dirt bikes a little bit. I said, okay, why not? Let's make this fun. So I threw my bow over my shoulder, uh, my sling. And he's like, what are you bringing that for? I'm like, well, you never know. He might, might get an elk. He's just like, dad, you're not gonna get an elk. I'm like, okay, well, you never know. So we drove out, we rode our dirt bikes out these old roads and, and I'd stop every now and then and bugle and, and then it was getting pretty dusk out. We probably had 40 minutes of, of shooting light left, maybe, may, probably less, probably 30 minutes of shooting light left. And I pulled over this spot and he's like, dad, what are you doing? I said, well, eh, let's bugle here. He's like, dad, you're not going to get a bull to answer. So I'm like, well, we'll see. We walk, I, so we walked over the edge. Um, and bugled off down into this nasty hell hole. And sure enough, three bulls answered me. So I'm like, come on, let's go. He's like, dad, you're not gonna get one. I'm like, well, we'll see. Let's go, let's go listen to him bugle. It'd be a great way to look, to end the day. Um, it's an awesome day. Let's, let's just go listen to him. So we walked over the hill, kind of got down closer to the, their level and started bugling and calling and in no time at all, this five point comes barging right in. And I could not get a shot. He just would not stop in any openings. And he kind of finally busted off. But there was this other bull that just kept bugling. And he getting closer and closer and closer. And I thought, well, got nothing to lose here. I'll, I'll see if I can get him to come in. So he climbs up the hill to us. And 
I had set Austin down right behind me, about five yards above me on the hill. I said, just sit here, don't make a move, just watch. And this bull comes up the hill and he gets to five yards and I shoot him. If, he, if I wouldn't have shot him, he would have walked right up and stepped on Austin because Austin was kind of hunkered down in the brush there. So I shoot him and he, he kind of whirls around and stops and looks around and I shoot again at a probably 10 yard shot and he kind of collapses and then gets back up and then runs down the hill probably 50 yards and just tumbles and he's done he's 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 dead and austin stood up and he's like dad you missed him i said no i didn't i said i shot him right here once and he went over there i shot him again he's like you did i said yeah and he's laying right there dead and he said he is i'm like heck yeah so we walked down there and on the way up there that day, that in the morning, he said, Dad, if you get an elk, I'm gonna have help you drag it out. Well, when we got up to that bull, he looked at it and he's like, Dad, we're not dragging this bull out. <laughs> and it's crazy. Uh, look, the number 13 has always kind of been my lucky number. And that was the 13th bull we'd actually heard that day. We'd heard 13 bulls that day. And it had called in the 13th bull, shot it. It was the night before my son's birthday and I was I felt really fortunate to have him there with me to uh, to experience all that um, so the next day was his birthday 10th birthday and uh, we let him skip school and he came out and he helped pack meat he didn't pack a lot of meat but he packed meat every trip so um, it was awesome father-son uh, time and that's my favorite elk hunt of all time and probably be pretty hard to beat so 2019 has been a year full of um, surprises and some struggles and um, I won't say it was a bad year but it was a different time, type of year. Um, early 2019 in about May I changed jobs. I got a job with uh, Phelps Game Calls and that's been super awesome. Um, you know, anytime you change jobs, it's kind of a big deal in your life. They say um, there's the, the two most dramatic times in a person's life are when they change jobs or when they move. Um, so I changed jobs, didn't move yet, uh, thank goodness. Um, and that was quite a, quite a, quite a change of pace, um, and, and it was good. Um, and, and one negative uh, setback I had in 2019 was... Um, I lost my mom. Um, she finally lost her battle with uh, dementia and um, though it seemed to be somewhat of a blessing that she finally passed because it's a it's a terrible disease that that people suffer from you know it's still um, it still took a lot out of um, a lot of wind out of my sails. Uh, I had to deal with with uh, overcoming the depression of that. Um, Kind of went to a dark place for a little while. I kind of let my um, my workout routine and my um, my nutritional diet, all that kind of slip by the wayside as I kind of fought through battling the the depression of losing my mom. Um, so that was that was a big setback. Um, so I wasn't really quite prepared for elk season like I normally am or should be. And then once elk season came, uh, went elk hunting in Wyoming with uh, Steve and Trent from Born and Raised Outdoors. And I had a slip and fall on day four as we were coming out from our bivy hunt. And I slipped on a rock as I was crossing the river and fell and hurt my shoulder, partially dislocating it. Uh, making my my right arm the arm I draw my bow with pretty much useless in that regard so I went home and I again there was a lot of depression from this setback um, I kind of felt hopeless like what was I gonna do to um, to get by here here I had a, a, an epic elk season lined up um, elk hunting in Wyoming with born and raised. Then I was going to go to New Mexico elk hunting with Brian Broderick and John Gabriel and try to hunt the crazy big bulls in New Mexico. 
I just had to take that hunt right off the table because it's a once in a lifetime type hunt and I wanted to be, you know, my wheelhouse to be functioning, fully functioning, my, my engines firing on all eight cylinders and, and here I was with a, a fouled up chicken wing and I, I couldn't even draw my bow. So, um, so that was a huge depression. So then as I sat around and I just didn't know what I was gonna do, um, I knew I, I knew about people shooting bows with a mouth tab, and I knew I knew you could do it. You know, good old Larry D. Jones had done it several times over the years, and a lot of other folks. And there's a lot of um, you know amputees that shoot Olympic shooters that that shoot well, way beyond any of my skills shooting with both arms. So I knew it could be done, but I had a very short time to learn how to do it. Um, but I'm, I thought, well, I'm going to go get my bow set up and have it ready just in case I feel like I can go hunting. Because I didn't want to have another slip and fall and hurt, re-injure my shoulder any worse because it, it hurt pretty bad. So I did the time. I did start doing some practicing with it. And I, and I found right away that, you know, to be accurate, 20 and 30 yards was pretty, pretty feasible. Out to 40, I was pretty, pretty decent out to 40 but that would be for like a follow-up shot. It wouldn't be for my first shot. So I felt confident enough to go elk hunting. And I thought, you know what? I'm gonna go ahead and just do it. I, I called my uh, camera guy, Dusty Roop, and I said, hey, uh, if you're willing to come up here and follow me around this crazy place, um, let's go hunting. So I got out of my funk, put all of that aside, washed it away, put it behind me, and uh, full steam ahead, because I knew that the real medicine for what was was ailing me was uh, the mountains and elk hunting. Elk hunting is it's hard work, you know, and sometimes you know the grind of it will kind of get you down. But I have to remember, I'm like, I live for this, I love it, and without without some suffering and some uh, without some setbacks and stuff, you know, the victory's not nearly so sweet. If it, if every time it came super easy, then would we even do it? Um, would, the, would it be so satisfying to finally be successful? Um, I know some people probably think, well, you know, you've hunted elk for a long time and, and spent years at this and you, you always get an elk. And sometimes I don't, you know, sometimes I don't get an elk. And, um, so it doesn't come easy. It comes with a lot of work, a lot of dedication, and um, a lot of struggles. But I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, I always say, you know, my September's not complete until I've had the lowest of lows and the highest of highs. And I have had failures. But then in the end, I, I, I don't want to succeed on the first day, as you're going to see um, in our Idaho hunt this year. Uh, we could have succeeded on the first day. I could have shot that five point. Some of you think I'm I'm crazy, um, but it was too early to have it to be over. We were there the first day. We have we had 14 days slated for for elk hunting, and it was it was it was less about the antlers. It was more about the adventure. I don't. I wouldn't consider myself a trophy hunter by no means, but I, I do hunt for trophy experiences. Yes, I want to kill a monster bull. Yes, I do, in, a, in the worst way. Sometimes you get one, some, most times you don't. Um, but if I shoot a five point on the very first day, who's to say what could have came the next, the next few days? And I had myself, and I was starting to doubt myself as the time went by through the hunt. Uh, we started out with some pretty nice weather, then it turned and it, we had rain upon rain upon rain and wet, brushy country is very demoralizing to hunt in because uh, elk usually don't bugle like they should and you're wet every day, all day. From the three minutes after stepping foot out of the truck, you're wet the entire time. So it's, it's tough. And all you coast guys that hunt the coastal region probably, probably know this. Um, and I questioned myself, I'm like, why did you pass up that bull on the first day? And then I had another opportunity uh, when my son was with us to shoot a, shoot a nice four by five, might as well call him a five point. I kind of questioned myself for that. It's like, maybe I made the wrong decision, but my September had not been complete yet. I hadn't had the, 
the lowest of lows yet. I'd had the highest of highs. I wanted to go dig through the lowest of lows, which we had. We, we had other hunters come in and foul up our hunt. We had weather that was foul and fouled up our hunt. I missed a bull. I missed a nice six point bull. That, that was a big setback. Um, that was a low point. Um, we, and then we, then the weather turned nice. So things started turning around and then once again, a low point, we got rain, check the forecast, rain and snow in the forecast for the remainder of the time that we we're going to be here. And I'll admit, I kind of felt like, um, we were, we may not get an elk this year. Maybe I was foolish to pass those bulls up, but I brushed it aside and just remember, I have to believe in my process. You have to believe 100% in your process. You have to have faith that at some point your process is going to work and you're going to be successful. On day one and day four, it was, it did work. But after that, it was not working. And I thought, well, I have to remember, I've, I've waited and, and held out and been and believed in my process before in the past and been successful on the last hour of the last day. So I knew it can happen. So we can't just sit around camp and wish it wasn't raining. We had to go back hunting and that's what we did. It's all I got is so bad, man.